The Antiquities of the Jews, Volume 3, by Flavius Josephus, Book 11, Chapter 5. How Xerxes, the son of Darius, was well disposed to the Jews, as also concerning Esdras and Nehemiah. Upon the death of Darius, Xerxes, his son, took the kingdom, who, as he inherited his father's kingdom, so did he inherit his piety towards God and honor of him. For he did all things suitably to his father relating to divine worship, and he was exceeding friendly to the Jews. Now about this time, a son of Jeshua, whose name was Joasim, was the high priest. Moreover, there was now in Babylon a righteous man, and one that enjoyed a great reputation among the multitude. He was the principal priest of the people, and his name was skillful in the laws of Moses, and was well acquainted with King Xerxes. He had determined to go up to Jerusalem, and to take with him some of those Jews that were in Babylon. And he desired that the king would give him an epistle to the governors of Syria, by which they might know who he was. Accordingly, the king wrote the following epistle to those governors. Xerxes, king of kings, to Esdras the priest, and reader of the divine law, greeting. I think it agreeable to that love which I bear to mankind to permit those of the Jewish nation that are so disposed, as well as those of the priests and Levites that are in our kingdom, to go together to Jerusalem. Accordingly, I have given command for that purpose, and let every one that hath a mind go, according as it hath seemed good to me and to my seven counselors, and this in order to their counselors, and this in order to their review of the affairs of Judea, to see whether they be agreeable to the law of God. Let them also take with them those presents which I and my friends have vowed with all that silver and gold that is found in the country of the Babylonians, as dedicated to God, and let all this be carried to Jerusalem to God for sacrifices. Let it also be lawful for thee and thy brethren to make as many vessels of silver and gold as thou pleasest. Thou shalt also dedicate those holy vessels which have been given thee, and as many more as thou hast a mind to make, and shalt take the expenses out of the king's treasury. I have, moreover, written to the treasurers of Syria and Phoenicia, that they take care of those affairs that Esdras the priest, and reader of the laws of God, is sent about, and that is sent about, and that God may not be at all angry with me or my children, I grant all that is necessary for sacrifices to God, according to the law, as far as a hundred cori of wheat. And I enjoin you not to lay any treacherous imposition or any tributes upon their priests or Levites or sacred singers or porters or sacred servants or scribes of the temple. And do thou, O Estras, appoint judges according to the wisdom given thee of God, and those such as understand the law, that they may judge in all Syria and Phoenicia. And do thou instruct those also which are ignorant of it, that if any one of thy countrymen transgress the law of God, or that of the king, he may be punished, as not transgressing it out of ignorance, but as one that knows it indeed, but boldly despises and condemns it, and finds. Farewell. When Estrus had received this epistle, he was very joyful and began to worship God, and confessed that he had been the cause of the king's great favor to him, and that for the same reason he gave all the thanks to God. So he read the epistle at Babylon to those Jews that were there. But he kept the epistle itself, and sent a copy of it to all those of his own nation that were in Media. And when these Jews had understood what piety the king had towards God, and what kindness he had for Esdras, they were all greatly pleased. Nay, many of them took their effects with them, and came to Babylon, as very desirous of going down to Jerusalem. But then the entire body of the people of Israel remained in that country. Wherefore there are but two tribes in Asia and Europe, subject to the Iomans, while the ten tribes are beyond Euphrates till now, and, till now, 
and are an immense multitude, and not to be estimated by numbers. Now there came a great number of priests, and Levites, and porters, and sacred singers, and sacred servants to Esdras. So he gathered those that were in the captivity, together beyond Euphrates, and stayed there three days, and ordained a fast for them, that they might make their prayers to God for their preservation, that they might suffer no misfortune by the way, either from their enemies or from any other ill accident. For Esdras had said beforehand that he had told the king how God would preserve them, and so he had not thought fit to request that he would send horsemen to conduct them. So when they had finished their prayers, they removed from Euphrates on the twelfth day of the first month of the seventh year of the reign of Xerxes. And they came to Jerusalem on the fifth month of the same year. Now Esdras presented the, now Esdras presented the sacred money to the treasurers, who were of the family of the priests, of silver six hundred and fifty talents, vessels of silver one hundred talents, vessels of gold twenty talents, vessels of brass that was more precious than gold, twelve talents by weight. For these presents had been made by the king and his counselors, and by all the Israelites that stayed at Babylon. So when Esdras had delivered these things to the priests, he gave to God, as the appointed sacrifices of whole burnt offerings, twelve bulls on account of the common preservation of the people, ninety rams, seventy-two lambs, and twelve kids of the goats, for the remission of sins. He also delivered the king's epistle to the king's officers, and to the governors of Celesyria and Phoenicia. And as they were under a necessity of doing what was enjoined by him, their necessities. Now these things were truly done under the conduct of Esdras, and he succeeded in them because God esteemed him worthy of the success of his conduct on account of his goodness and righteousness. But some time afterward there came some persons to him, and brought an accusation against certain of the multitude, and of the priests and Levites, who had transgressed their settlement, and dissolved the laws of their country, by marrying strange wives, and had brought the family of the priests into confusion. These persons desired him to support the laws, lest God should take up a general anger against them all, and reduce them to a calamitous condition again. Hereupon he rent his garment immediately out of grief, and pulled off the hair of his head and beard, and cast himself upon the ground, because this crime had reached, crime had reached the principal men among the people, and considering that if he should enjoin them to cast out their wives and the children they had by them, he should not be hearkened to. He continued lying upon the ground. However, all the better sort came running to him, who also themselves wept, and partook of the grief he was under for what had been done. So Esdras rose up from the ground, and stretched out his hands towards heaven, and said that he was ashamed to look towards it, because of the sins which the people had committed, while they had cast out of their memories what their fathers had undergone on account of their wickedness. And he besought God, who had saved a seed and a remnant out of the calamity and captivity they had been in, and had restored them again to Jerusalem and to their own land, and had obliged the kings of Persia to have compassion on them, that he would also forgive them their sins they had now committed, which that he would also forgive them their sins they had now committed, which though they deserved death, yet was it agreeable to the mercy of God to remit even to these the punishment due to them. After Esdras had said this, he left off praying. And when all those that came to him with their wives and children were under lamentation, one whose name was Jaconius, a principal man in Jerusalem, came to him and said that they had sinned in marrying strange wives, and he persuaded him to adjure them all to cast those wives out, and the children born of them, and that those should be punished who would not obey the law. So Esdras hearkened to this advice, and made the heads of the priests, and of the Levites, and of the Israelites, swear that they would put away those wives and children, according to the advice of Jaconius. And when he had received their oaths, he went of Eliasib, 
and as he had hitherto tasted nothing at all for grief, so he abode there that day. And when proclamation was made that all those of the captivity should gather themselves together to Jerusalem, and those that did not meet there in two or three days should be banished from the multitude, and that their substance should be appropriated to the uses of the temple, according to the sentence of the elders, those that were of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin came together in three days, viz. on the twentieth day of the ninth month, which, according to the Hebrews, is called Tebeth, and according to the Macedonians, Apelias. Now as they were sitting in the upper room of the temple, where the elders also were present, but were uneasy because of the cold, Esther stood up and accused them, and told them that they had sinned in marrying wives that were not of their own nation, but that now they would do a thing both plea to God and advantageous to themselves, if they would put those wives away. Accordingly, they all cried out that they would do so. That, however, the multitude was great, and that the season of the year was winter, and that this work would require more than one or two days. Let their rulers therefore, said they, and those that have married strange wives, come hither at a proper time, while the elders of every place that are in common, to estimate the number of those that have thus married, are to be there also. Accordingly, this was resolved on by them, and they began the inquiry after those that had married strange wives on the first day of the tenth month, and continued the inquiry to the first day of the next month, and found a great many of the posterity of Jeshua the high priest, and of the priests and Levites and Israelites, who had a greater regard to the observation of the law than to their natural affection, than to their natural affection, and immediately cast out their wives and the children which were born of them. And in order to appease God, they offered sacrifices and slew rams as oblations to him. But it does not seem to me to be necessary to set down the names of these men. So when Esdras had reformed this sin about the marriages of the forementioned persons, he reduced that practice to purity, so that it continued in that state for the time to come. Now when they kept the Feast of Tabernacles in the seventh month, and almost all the people were come together to it, they went up to the open part of the temple, to the gate which looked eastward, and desired of Esdras that the laws of Moses might be read to them. Accordingly he stood in the midst of the multitude and read them, and this he did from morning to noon. Now by hearing the laws read to them, they were instructed to them, they were instructed to be righteous men for the present and for the future. But as for their past offenses, they were displeased at themselves, and proceeded to shed tears on their account, as considering with themselves that if they had kept the law, they had endured none of these miseries which they had experienced. But when Esdras saw them in that disposition, he bade them go home, and not weep for that it was a festival, and that they ought not to weep thereon, for that it was not lawful so to do. He exhorted them rather to proceed immediately to feasting, and to do what was suitable to a feast, and what was agreeable to a day of joy, but to let their repentance and sorrow for their former sins be a security and a guard to them, that they fell no more into the like offenses. So upon Esdras's exhortation they began to feast, and when they had so done for eight days, hymns to God, and returning thanks to Esdras for his reformation of what corruptions had been introduced into their settlement. So it came to pass that after he had obtained this reputation among the people, he died an old man, and was buried in a magnificent manner at Jerusalem. About the same time it happened also that Joasim the high priest died, and his son Eliasib succeeded in the high priesthood. Now there was one of those Jews that had been carried captive who was cupbearer to King Xerxes. His name was Nehemiah. As this man was walking before Susa, the metropolis of the Persians, he heard some strangers that were entering the city after a long journey, speaking to one another in the Hebrew tongue. So he went to them and asked them whence they came. And when their answer was that they came from Judea, 
he began to inquire of them again in what he began to inquire of them again in what state the multitude was and in what condition jerusalem was and when they replied that they were in a bad state for that their walls were thrown down to the ground and that the neighboring nations did a great deal of mischief to the jews while in the day time they overran the country and pillaged it and in the night did them mischief insomuch that not a few were led away captive out of the country and out of jerusalem itself and that the roads were in the daytime found full of dead men hereupon nehemiah shed tears out of commiseration of the calamities of his countrymen and looking up to heaven he said how long o lord wilt thou overlook our nation while it suffers so great miseries and while we are made the prey and spoil of all men and while he stayed at the gate and lamented thus one told him that the king one told him that the king was going to sit down to supper so he made haste and went as he was without wishing himself to minister to the king his office of cup-bearer but as the king was very pleasant after supper and more cheerful than usual he cast his eyes on nehemiah and seeing him look sad he asked him why he was sad whereupon he prayed to god to give him favor and afford him the power of persuading by his words and said how can i o king appear otherwise than thus and not be in trouble while i hear that the walls of jerusalem the city where are the sepulchres of my fathers are thrown down to the ground and that its gates are consumed by fire but do thou grant me the favor to go and build its walls and to finish the building of the temple accordingly the king gave him a signal that he freely granted him winners that they might pay him due honor and afford him whatsoever assistance he wanted and as he pleased leave off thy sorrow then said the king and be cheerful in the performance of thy office hereafter so nehemiah worshipped god and gave the king thanks for his promise and cleared up his sad and cloudy countenance by the pleasure he had from the king's promises accordingly the king called for him the next day and gave him an epistle to be carried to adias the governor of syria and phoenicia and samaria wherein he sent to him to pay due honor to nehemiah and to supply him with what he wanted for his building now when he was come to babylon and had taken with him many of his countrymen who voluntarily followed him he came to jerusalem in the twenty and fifth year of the reign of xerxes and when he had shown the epistles to god he gave them to adias and to, and to the other governors he also called together all the people to Jerusalem, and stood in the midst of the temple, and made the following speech to them. You know, O Jews, that God hath kept our fathers Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in mind continually, and for the sake of their righteousness hath not left off the care of you. Indeed, he hath assisted me in gaining this authority of the king to raise up our wall and finish what is wanting of the temple. I desire you, therefore, who well know the ill will our neighboring nations bear to us, and that when once they are made sensible that we are in earnest about building, they will come upon us and contrive many ways of obstructing our works, that you will, in the first place, put your trust in God, as in him that will assist us against their hatred, and to intermit building neither night nor day, but to use all diligence, and to hasten on the work day, but to use all diligence, and to hasten on the work. Now we have this a special opportunity for it. When he had said this, he gave order that the rulers should measure the wall and part the work of it among the people, according to their villages and cities, as every one's ability should require. And when he had added this promise that he himself with his servants would assist them, he dissolved the assembly. So the Jews prepared for the work. That is the name they are called by from the day that they came up from Babylon, which is taken from the tribe of Judah, which came first to these places, and thence both they and the country gained that appellation. But now when the Ammonites and Moabites and Samaritans and all that inhabited Cilicia 
heard that the building went on apace, they took it heinously, and proceeded to lay snares for them and to hinder their intentions, not how they might destroy Nehemiah himself, by hiring some of the foreigners to kill him. They also put the Jews in fear, and disturbed them, and spread abroad rumors, as if many nations were ready to make an expedition against them, by which means they were harassed, and had almost left off the building. But none of these things could deter Nehemiah from being diligent about the work. He only set a number of men about him as a guard to his body, and so unweariedly persevered therein, and was insensible of any trouble, out of his desire to perfect this work. And thus did he attentively and with great forecast take care of his own safety, not that he feared death, but of this persuasion that if he were dead, the walls for his citizens would never be raised. He also gave orders that the builders should keep their ranks and have their armor on while they were building. Accordingly, the mason had his sword on, had his sword on as well as he that brought the materials for building. He also appointed that their shields should lie very near them, and he placed trumpeters at every five hundred feet, and charged them that if their enemies appeared, they should give notice of it to the people, that they might fight in their armor, and their enemies might not fall upon them naked. He also went about the compass of the city by night, being never discouraged, neither about the work itself, nor about his own diet and sleep, for he made no use of those things for his pleasure, but out of necessity. And this trouble he underwent for two years and four months, for in so long a time was the wall built, in the twenty-eighth year of the reign of Xerxes, in the ninth month. Now when the walls were finished, Nehemiah and the multitude offered sacrifices to God for the building of them, and they continued in feasting eight days. However, when feasting eight days, however, when the nations which dwelt in Syria heard that the building of the wall was finished, they had indignation at it. But when Nehemiah saw that the city was thin of people, he exhorted the priests and the Levites that they would leave the country and remove themselves to the city, and there continue. And he built them houses at his own expenses, and he commanded that part of the people which were employed in cultivating the land to bring the tithes of their fruits to Jerusalem, that the priests and Levites, having whereof they might live perpetually, might not leave the divine worship, who willingly hearkened to the constitutions of Nehemiah, by which means the city Jerusalem came to be fuller of people than it was before. So when Nehemiah had done many other excellent things, and things worthy of commendation, in a glorious manner he came to a great age, and then died. He was, and then died. He was a man of a good and righteous disposition, and very ambitious to make his own nation happy. And he hath left the walls of Jerusalem as an eternal monument for himself. Now this was done in the days 